What is interoperability? Some of the ways you'll hear it talked about is it's described here. This device is interoperable. Interoperable with what? This device meets specific standards. Well, that's good. Are they the right standards? This device meets interconnection requirements. That was not so bad. Requirements is kind of holistic. You know, you, you, if, there were, if they're written well, maybe it, it will work. It's been through testing, first party, second or third party testing. And it's on a certified equipment list. So let's get into the guts of interoperability. Here's a standards-based definition. Interoperability is the ability of two or more systems or components to exchange information and to use the information that has been exchanged. To put it very simply, interoperability is when things work well together. But you have to remember that it's not just things and devices. Remember we've talked about the holistic picture of interoperability where it's a system perspective. Everything needs to work together. And that includes devices and systems and people. And you're part of that system with the regulatory uh, uh, angle. You have a, uh, an ability to look at this entire system and help to inform and guide and lead and adjudicate some of the rate cases that come before you. These devices are gonna show up everywhere on the system. So I've just had a few examples here that are listed. But the important part here to think of is, let's take it from talking about a device and talking about how a device interacts with another device or a system. That place where it meets is an interface. That interface is what the uh, visual on the right side is trying to explain. You know, who needs to talk to whom? What needs to be communicated? What are the roles and responsibilities? But when you boil it down to that interface perspective, what information needs to be exchanged across the interface? How are we going to define the interfaces in the system? So there's an architecture perspective that comes to play here. And there's very specific ones where you want to have that system be able to be upgraded in the future and modified. You don't want to create your interfaces to be so brittle that you're going to have to do a lot of work to change them. You want the ability to make them uh, adaptable and evolvable. So let's look at interoperability, this integration at arm's length. So not too tightly together, giving system uh, ability to breathe and live and evolve. And think about it from a, a point of view of a, a post office, the mail infrastructure. There's a government role in the mail. There is uh, business processes. There's automation. But from the consumer perspective, what's wonderful is that you can put a stamp that doesn't even have a, a, a value on it anymore, put it in the mail system, and have some expectation that it will get delivered reliably somewhere else across the system. That's a very important point, is that the, th there's some coherence to the system. And in particular, with uh, uh, the, the government role, et cetera, there are regulations. There's rules that will help prohibit someone from opening your mail and reading it. So there's regulation uh, built in with the system. And if you look at all the different details of this, you have the exchange of actionable information, you have the shared meaning of the information. So for example, a zip code in the mail gets you to a location, and then a street address gets you to a very specific location. You have agreed upon expectations for what's going to happen with that exchange. And you have a requisite quality uh, of service uh, in this exchange. So I've kind of teed up interoperability and defined it. I'm going to turn things over now to David Forfia, who will take us through the rest. And hi, I'm David Forfia. Uh, today I'm presenting on, from the perspective of the chairman of the Gridwise Architecture Council. And while I do work at an ISO, today I am presenting on behalf of the council, which brings me to which way is the point? The ever popular GWAC stack. So um, for those who are attending the conference today, you've got a copy of the GWAC stack that got handed out as materials. For those of you who are watching this, you can pick this up at the Gridwise Architecture website. Just Google us, and you'll be able to find it. 
So I'll talk about this briefly because there's a lot of boxes on here. So first question is, couldn't you come up with a simpler diagram? <laughs> so the purpose of architecture is twofold. One, it helps with explanation about what we want to talk about, but it also helps break down the problem into manageable boxes to where you can figure out how to talk about those individual boxes and get some clarity about it. So without going to, to into each one of the boxes, I'll stay at the high level. Organization, what things that we want to have in place from an interoperability perspective regarding the regulation, the business objectives, and the policies. What do you want to go through and accomplish? We saw part of that with the goals from the California example about what you wanted to end up with, grid decarbonization. Informational is all about the semantics. What's the data? What information are you trying to go through and exchange? The technical really gets into the physical devices and how those things talk to each other. So we've covered that sort of at a high level. The cross-cutting issues are things that apply across the entire stack. So security and privacy, uh, making sure that you have transactional integrity. It's a very important part of how to make everything work together. However, looking at the GWAC stack in the aggregate, it's kind of difficult to get through all the pieces. So I bring you to the next level down. I affectionately call this the Plinko board which simplifies the questions about how to go through and answer questions architecturally about how to actually make a decision. This is borrowed from the NIST Smart Grid Framework um, document, excellent document going through and explaining how the standards work together. But if you take a look at the Plinko board, up at the top level, you're really at the top level of the GWAC stack. What's the vision you're trying to accomplish? What are you really trying to do? Who's actually going to be able to do that? That's really a policy type decision. It's the business driver. It's the business context for what you're trying to accomplish. The bottom left corner, very specific technical implementation. So down there, if we're going to use the USB example, we're not going through and saying it's just a USB. We're down to the point that says it's a Kingston USB. It has to have this amount of megs. If you work at a place like I do, it has to have very specific security requirements to plug something into our systems to make sure that nothing magically appears on them. So there's some very specific things about the technology that get defined in the bottom left corner. So when you start from an architecture perspective and you start from a business capability perspective and what you want to accomplish, your goals, your objectives as regulators, and going through and saying what you want to accomplish with what you're doing within the regularization and the policy that you're setting up starts to drive towards what that physical implementation ends up with. Paul covered parts of this about what you want to accomplish, how do you want to be able to get there, what choices do you want driven down to the technology. That's a very specific way to go through an architecture stack falling through the Plinko board to go from the top left corner, answering the questions to get to the bottom. The other challenge is when you have people who go through and want to talk about technology. I often have to talk about blockchain, which usually starts out with, I have blockchain, let's do cool stuff. Blockchain's down in the very bottom left corner of this board. So if someone comes to you and says, we want to do blockchain, the question is, for what? Because ultimately, it's a business choice. Now, blockchain may be a really good choice and may meet a really neat business objective. But if you start down in that bottom left-hand corner from an implementation perspective with that as your driver, the challenge you run into is you're trying to find a business objective to justify the technology. That doesn't always work. In some cases, it may. Right? But it's driven by your business objectives and what you're trying to get to. So hold on, I'll take one more point on this slide. So it's a Plinko board. It goes two directions from an architecture because think about the way standards work. They're always in revision. Technology on a grid in an electric utility lasts for years. Thankfully, we don't have to replace it all all at once. So at some point, you're not in a bottom left-hand corner. You may to be in the middle of this grid and having to make decisions about how things need to be replaced and go through and change. The questions that are asked within this framework help drive what you would do as a regulator 
help drive what you do from a technology perspective, may help drive what you do from a policy perspective for all those investments. So back for some specific examples when we start talking about the different sets. Talked briefly about the stamp example up at the top. What are the processes for settling bills? A lot of the standards have the business processes already defined in them. Some of the NASB standards actually go through and define here's what the business processes are, as well as the next level down about the information specifics about what's contained within it. Technical gets down to the what are you really going to go through and choose? Are you going to pick two AMI vendors? Are you going to use a Kingston USB? Must you have a drive that ensures that it's encrypted when you plug it into the USB? All those things tie into the crack stack. Following the questions on the Plinko board that I just went through, help drive the decisions as you go through each part of the Glack stack. So we talked at a high level that says, in some cases, it's a challenge to get from interoperability if you don't have standards, but it's easy in the beginning. So borrowed this slide from Scott Newman. Um, and up at the top, if you don't have a standard, you can do a point-to-point -point integration. Engineers are great at that. I'm a technology geek. I'm really good at that. The challenge with that is I can build it fast. Then you're going to pay me each time I have to go through and do that integration. Every time something changes with shorter lifespans, you have to go through and pay for that integration each and every time. As you start to get through standards and use standards as your actual applicability for doing those interconnections, the interfaces are much easier to go through and define. You isolate the physical things, the components within the systems, and you can actually go through and map them. And the cost to implement increases, but the overall cost to maintain declines. If you get to the point where you have a common model, the costs decline even more but you've spent the time to define the standards to go through and do it. And then ultimately, like it's taken with the USB drives, when you get the plug and play, all the money is already spent for defining what the plug and play device is. When you plug it in, the USB works. That's a nice example to use from a computer, but the best example I have is a wall outlet. Because if I want to access the grid, I plug stuff in, it powers up, it charges my laptop that I left running on the plane and make sure that the battery works. But ultimately, as you take a look at what standards do, the farther you get down to the bottom, there's a lot of investment from not only the collaboration, the standards bodies, all the participants to get to the point to where plug and play actually works. So back to Dr. Woolman's slide about the post office. I'll do a very specific example from my current employer. So I work for ERCOT. We use two standards that are codified within our protocols. Right? One is a common information model. Common information model defines the interconnection and how all the devices exist and can be modeled on the transmission distribution and markets part of the, dis of the grid. ERCOT in our protocol section three actually defines how we exchange information about our models with our transmission and distribution providers. We define what the model is. At the time we picked, because at some point standards always evolve, but regulators have timelines when they ask us to implement systems. So please finish by this date. We had to pick a choice about which version of the SIM we were going to use for that interoperability. We worked with all our stakeholders to go through and say, here's what we're going to do. The SIM wasn't 100% complete. It's always under revision. So we picked a model. We picked a version. We established it with our stakeholders. We extended it to meet our needs. We made sure that that was published for all of our stakeholders to use, and they could build their systems to use that model to exchange with the extensions to go from there. The downside of that, we're on a version of the SIM that we set when we went through live with the system. The SIM has modified since that time. At some point, we're going to get with all our stakeholders and say, 
is it time to move to a new version of the SIM? Is there anything that's new within the SIM that we want to implement? Is there anything in the new version of the SIM that's been codified by IEC that we need to extend? And we'll do the same work again. However, we went live with Texas Nodal in 2011. We're running on that same standard. We've changed the systems behind it that output that system a number of times. Our market participants have had to make no changes to their systems while we continue to maintain ours. The other example I'll use, NASB. ERCOT and one of the functions is the business to business portal for us to be able to enable retail switching. And we are the sort of the firewall between retail electric providers and the transmission and distribution service providers. And we do the exchange with that. We use the NASB EDM 1.6 standard that goes through and defines here's what the standard is for how we're going to do all of the retail transactions that make up our market. We're now on Texas set version four which has gone through an iteration since 2002 to its current version that is quite literally a profile of that standard. So the standards at a relatively high level, the standards that we put into the Texas set, working with our stakeholders and following all the rules, actually ends up being the Texas set formation that says, here's exactly what makes up each transaction type, here's the business process for how it gets exchanged between all the participants in our market. And if there's any changes to that, it's codified through our rules making process. It's codified in our profiles at, within, our, uh, uh, within our tariffs. And it actually goes through and our board actually established that in conjunction with the Public Utility Commission of Texas. So we have the regulatory construct. We've gone through and done all the automation. We've established the standards. And that's the way our market can function using standards to reduce the cost to all our participants and the stakeholders for ERCOT within Texas. With that, any questions? Thank you. <laughs>